Hello and a warm welcome to Talking Stocks. I'm Kukuletu Tele. Also with me in studio every week is Brian Rudd and Sean Ashton, both from Anchor Capital. Now they are the experts and together we bring you insightful analysis into both JSE and global listed companies. On today's show, we're looking at Denmark listed jewelry company Pandora AS. Founded back in 1982, the company now has a presence in 90 countries across six continents. Pandora is publicly listed on the NASDAQ OMX Copenhagen Stock Exchange. And last year, the company saw a total revenue of about 1.8 billion US dollars. So clearly this is a big company that we're talking about, not necessarily small fry. But maybe if we can get more perspective as to who exactly is uh, Pandora, Sean? So Pandora, as you've mentioned, it's, it's listed in Denmark, but really this is a business that sells um, charm-related jewelry around the world. So um, the, the bulk of their revenues really are the United States and Western Europe. It's quite a, quite a global business, but very much developed markets as it stands now. And, and very attractive metrics. As, as you've mentioned, they, they generate about 11.7 billion Danish kroner of revenue, about $2 billion. Um, very high margin business, so they, they, they sell their products around the world, but the manufacturing is located in Thailand, mm. uh, in, a, in a city called Jamopolis. Um, so it's a th they generate about a 36% EBITDA margin, um, and returns on capital are exceptional, roughly 36% uh, return on equity as it stands now. And that's with the balance sheet that's quite lazy. They've got a lot of cash in their balance sheet. So a very good quality company. Um, they've they've ha been through a few cycles, but o over the long term, we think this is a good business. There is also a Disney connection, I understand there, Brian. Mm. Yes, very much so. It was uh, last year they had an agreement to start manufacturing Disney-related charms. This originally started out as some of the classic Disney characters, Mickey Mouse, Goofy, Donald Duck, and then also bringing in the, the Disney princesses that have been around for a little while, Snow White, uh, etc. And this has been an, an unbelievable success for them. It was predominantly sold in the US, and in the last, corner of that ra last quarter of that range sold out completely into the Christmas period. Um, it's, as I say, been very successful for them. It is a long-term relationship. It runs through for about 10 years, so they've still got a lot more legs in this. Mm. Um, and the one thing we'll see is it kind of brings in a new consumer for them. So mom has her Pandora bracelet with her charms. Daughter goes with to go and have a look and goes, oh, mom, I want one of those. So you're bringing in a, a, a new demographic as well. Um, so it's been a very successful range for them and believe it will continue to be. Um, but it must be stated, it is a small part of the business. Um, so it is growing, but it is a small revenue driver at this stage. How big is this monster? We did mention that it does have uh, operations on six continents, but uh, where does it fit into the scheme of things when it comes to its competitors? The likes of Tiffany's, I don't know if Swarovski can also be labeled in there? It's so, so very small. I think the, oh. the, the point to make is that these guys don't compete in the hard luxury end of the segment. Mm -hmm. And they're a much smaller operator than the, you know, the likes of a Richemont or an LVMH. And you can see that in the size of their business. So, mm -hmm. so the market cap of this company is of the order of uh, $12 billion or so, which if you, if you translate it into South African terms, that would make it roughly twice the size of Mr. Price. Um, so it's, it's not a huge business, but a very, very niche player operating, not at the very low end of jewelry. I mean, the price points we're talking about, you know, if, if you walk into a Pandora store and you want to buy um, a, a charm bracelet and with a couple of charms associated with it and maybe a ring, you're in for expenditure of maybe 200 US dollars, you know, maybe two, two, two and a half thousand rand. Mm -hmm. So it's not very high end and it's not very low end. It's affordable luxury. Affordable luxury. Yeah. Is it working in the markets that they operate in? Because they do have quite an intensive geographic uh, diversification strategy. Very much so. I um, you know, if we look at the company the, in the last uh, quarter of results, they had 19% growth in the US. They had 41% growth in Europe, which is exceptional considering the state which Europe is in. And this again highlights this affordability. You're not necessarily just purely reliant on the 1%. And you're not losing market share when your lower demographic, unfortunately, has, is tight for cash. Yeah. So it really has played well for them. And also had great growth out of Asia at about 53%, in total leading to 33% growth in revenue. So they've done very well in their specific regions. And I think it really is the fact that they position themselves exceptionally well. And they don't do everything. They're not, uh, as Sean points out, a Richmond or even a, a Michael Kors that deals with expanding their range. Here they deal with bracelets, charms, rings, and they do it exceptionally well. So when you keep it simple, you've got to make sure you do it properly. Is it simple enough for South Africans? I understand that they might have some exposure to this. They do. So I mean, you'll find that down the road from here, there's a store in Santon City. 
um, a, a Pandora, what they call a concept store. Mm -hmm. uh, some of these stores are owned by the group and some of them are franchised. But from a brand perspective, this is the fastest growing point of distribution for the business, is, is their concept stores. So a lot, of the, a lot of the retail takes place through third party distributors, third party points of sale, other retailers where you don't really, saw, you don't really see the shop front Pandora. Um, but um, th they've now got, um, I think it's about five, sorry, 1,400 concept stores around the world, which is up 30% year on year. And, that's th and that point of, point of sale is, is now about 56% of sales, which is up materially from the prior year. Sure. So they're getting the brand out there, they're getting the awareness out there, and I think it's important to have a, a brand presence to, to drive your business. And that certainly is the fastest growing part of their business. And just getting back to the, the turnover growth, I think it's worthwhile mentioning that when you go back to 2010, um, you know, when we st first started looking at this business in 2013, they'd had two or three years of quite a tough time. Um, in, in 2010, they, they had the impact of commodity prices rising significantly, yeah. gold and silver, which started to impact in their costs. Uh, and that, as a result, they, they did two things. They tried to move their price points upwards to account for this very aggressively. And they changed their sales mix to more gold jewelry, more high-end jewelry, and that met with a significant resistance in the market. And there's been some management changes since then. I think we've got a new CEO, a new yeah. CFO, and they've gone back to basics. They say, this is what our core market is, affordable luxury, um, and it's working incredibly well. And you've seen 30% compound growth um, for, the, for the few years since 2012 odd. I want us to go back to the revenue line there because you're quite right that yeah. between 2010 and 2012 uh, the revenues were, were fairly flat. flat. Yeah. Uh, but moving forward, it does seem as though the guidance for 2015 is uh, very, very impressive. It's here. very strong. Very strong. Yeah, I mean you've had you, you had 33% last year. At the beginning of the new financial year, they're saying that the, the number they're guiding to implies at least 20% revenue growth. Mm. Now there's a bit of a currency tailwind in that, so the dollar is probably 5% stronger against the Danish krona. So on average, we think it means about 15% constant currency sales growth that they're guiding to. Um, and I think if, you, if you're confident enough to put that out there, and they, they've become increasingly conservative in recent years with their guidance, because they got burnt in that 2010 to 2012 period. Um, so they've become more conservative. And I think if you're saying that, the, the sales trends they're seeing right now must be significantly stronger and more in line with what we saw towards the back end of last year. I just want to throw another element to the mix there. Obviously, the slump in commodity prices does impact the business quite strongly, but uh, global growth and consumer optimism, uh, are we seeing that taking a bit or expected to have a bit of an impact on their sales numbers going forward? Mm, we don't think so. You know, you're looking at the, the US is probably your biggest driving market at the moment from a, a GDP growth perspective. And there was a little bit of concern around the, the delivery of that segment in their business, mm -hmm. and it exceeded expectations last year or in the last quarter as well. You, you're seeing China slow down to 7% growth. How do you slow down at 7%? But anyway, it's, it's a great business. And there they're driving consumerism. They've had the industrialization, they've built the roads, the buildings. Now they're trying to drive the consumer, getting more money into the consumer's product, get banks lending, benefits here. So, uh, and as we, we mentioned a little bit earlier, or Sean and I were fair, that you're looking here that there's no legacy in China. So they're not coming in when you, ha you weren't allowed to um, give little gifts to people in return for favors. Mm. They, they don't have this legacy. They're coming in here fresh. They've got a distribution agreement with somebody, um, which they take over full distribution of in 2018. Then it becomes theirs, which is a great business plan for them. At the moment, it adds minimal to the, to the line, the revenue line, but the potential there to grow is exceptional. Mm. So, uh, and as I mentioned a little bit earlier, you've got Europe as well that has delivered growth. So. I think they seem to be really well positioned that the slowdown is not going to go and take 20% away from the, their growth prospects. You are still going to see some good numbers come through. Sean rightly points out they are conservative in their estimates. And if they're putting out 20%, you potentially could look to slightly more. But this is a management team that is a quality business. They seem to have a very good structure within it. Two people have left in senior positions, yeah. been replaced. The machine keeps turning. So I think you, you're in for a bit of a, a nice ride with this business. A nice ride. And 20%, if that's the low of the base, then uh, clearly optimism still remains. Let's touch on the EBITDA margins, the gross EBITDA margins, mm. as well as the, the valuation of the share price. Sure. So I think from, from a margin point of view, there's been a cycle in this business. And it's, and it's largely related to commodity prices. So when you look back to 2009, the gross margin was about 71%. It then got down to the, the high 60s and that's now rising again. And as a result, 
um, operating margins also came off during that time period. The, you know, the, the kind of trough was 2012, I think. Uh, and really, this was related to soaring commodity prices, specifically gold and silver. Mm -hmm. These guys hedge forward their, their takeout cover for their requirements between six and 12 months. So there's always a lag impact. So what you're seeing now is the benefit of gold and silver having come off significantly. And actually, it hasn't fully filtered through into the numbers yet. So when you look through to 2014's figures, they, they quoted a gross margin of 70%. But they said that had the effect of hedging been taken out of it, it would have been 73%. So as you continue to cover forward with lower spot prices, um, that benefit will flow through. And we're expecting to see much higher margins in the year ahead. So actually, from a growth point of view, we would expect to see significantly stronger earnings, gro earnings growth than the top line growth that they're projecting for the coming year. Uh, we think they'll grow by more than 30%, certainly, uh, for at, an, at an EPS level. And, and obviously, you know, the longer gold and silver prices remain low, uh, that's of huge benefit to them because the sens sensitivity is quite high. Quite high. Well, I think yeah, I know where you guys feel when it comes to the buy hold segment of this particular show. But uh, let's get the experts' view now on this particular stock: buy hold or sell. <music> Brian, your perspective: buy hold, sell. Very much on the buy side. Um, I think it's a great quality business. Um, they've got a, a history of delivering. They have learned from their mistakes, and they have a very, very, very good growth profile going forward. So for me. Very good buy. I take it you share the same sentiment, Sean? I do. I mean, it's, it's worthwhile pointing out that we invested for our clients at about 218 Danish kroner in, in the stock, and that was about uh, that was in early 2013. So the share price has more or less trebled since then. It's doubled over the last year. And inside that number, the valuation from a P multiple point of view has gone from, call it a Ford 13 or 14, to about a Ford 18. Mm -hmm. So you've had great earnings growth, uh, some re-rating as well. And I think we're now getting back to the point where the margins are closer to, to, to being normal than, than they were in the past. So, so we mustn't get too carried away about margins beyond 2015. But um, I think the valuation is still reasonable. Um, we've had great performance out of it. The valuation is reasonable. But I think more importantly, they appear to have enormous top line momentum. And there's optionality in their Chinese business, which I think is not in the price right now. Hmm. Uh, when you look at the hard luxury companies, they're all dealing with the legacy of having a third of their business in China, and that's coming under pressure. These guys are brand new. They're fresh in that market, and I think they can grow off a low base. So, mm -hmm. so certainly a buy. Certainly a buy. From a management perspective, the C-suite changes that we saw, you're not nervous about that? Um, we have yet to see evidence of them stumbling, let's put it that way. They've, put, they've, they've gone back to basics with their strategy. It's working very well now, um, and uh, yeah, we, we've, yet to be, we, we've yet to see evidence of problems. So. Sean and Brian, thank you so much for your time today. Well, you've heard it from uh, the experts themselves, uh, buy uh, for Pandora, quite obviously. But that's where we leave it for Talking Stocks uh, for this week. Uh, do catch us again next time.